Hello, film fans. Welcome to the Film vs. Film podcast. My name is Martin Harries, your host, and I'm joined by the film encyclopedia man, Boaz Dix. We are a couple of filmmakers on occasion, but mainly can't stop yapping about movies. On this podcast, every episode we pick a topic from a film that's coming out at the cinema or on VOD. Myself and Boaz pick our favourite film from that topic, or team up against a guest and battle it out to decide which film will become the greatest film of all time. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave us a five-star review and subscribe. Please enjoy part two. Hi guys, Martin here, just jumping in ahead of the podcast, getting started. As you might have already guessed, Boaz has not been on a few of our recent podcasts. Just to say, Boaz is taking a break from the podcast at the moment. He's got a few issues he's dealing with in his personal life, so that needs uh, a lot of attention um, for him. So... I don't know when he'll be back. He might not ever be back. I'm not sure. Um, But hopefully he will later on this year. But I'm sure, like myself, we all wish him well. And hopefully he will come back at some point. Enjoy our Mission Impossible episode. Thank you. Bye. Hello, guys. Welcome to part two of the podcast. Should we have a look at some responses then for Indiana Jones films? On Instagram, I asked the question, of course, what Indiana Jones film would you go for? How many films in a year podcast went with Temple of Doom? For sure. Two exclamation marks. Mm. Uh, Anton Kinnelove, uh, a regular responder, went with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusades. And a podcast I've never heard of, uh, One of Us is Bored, <laughs> went with Last hey. Crusade. <laughs> <laughs> Betraying their choice. (laughs) They sound really cool. I wonder if people should go check them out. (laughs) I forgot you could see the void. (laughs) It'd be a bit of a pointless Instagram thing if if I couldn't see it. (laughs) I thought it was just a random Uh, call (laughs) for. Cringe. Yeah. The Anorak Oasis podcast went with uh, Raiders mainly because of Salah. Mm-hmm. And Take 97 podcast, David Ingram went with Temple of Doom. So, hey, so we um, weren't totally last, dude. We were like, no, <laughs> we won the people's choice. Yeah, <laughs> people, yeah, <laughs> people's choice awards. Yeah. But yeah, podcast friends help yeah. podcast friends yes. with engagement. So, yeah. We're <laughs> yeah, even though you betray your own choice, yes, apparently so. Um, <laughs> well, to be fair, to be fair, with our own voting score, we betrayed our own choice. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You didn't understand the concept. Yeah. <laughs> film versus yeah, film, what? Yeah. So my choice then for Mission Impossible films, I went with Mission Impossible Fallout. I do think it is the best one. It kind of goes against tradition a little bit because before this film, they had all always had different film directors directing all the films, but Chris McQuarrie certainly made apparently made a conscious choice to try and direct it as if it was a different director which is interesting i kind of can see that from rogue nation yeah i mean i was thinking about maybe being a bit kinder to you guys (laughs) because i know this is kind of more of a direct sequel to rogue nation so it's a bit naughty but the action scenes are so impressive i was just like you've got to see this you know it's it's so insane (laughs) in my opinion so I, th- I think you can get away with watching it without ha- having much prior knowledge about previous events, I think. It'll be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. But yeah, I just think this is definitely my number one action scenes are off the, off the chain. And, you know, Macquarie still has some kind of really intricate um, storytelling things he goes with here. Maybe Maybe not as intricate as his first Mission Impossible outing with Rogue Nation. There's more twists and turns maybe in that. But yeah, this this is just, for me, an action masterclass, really. So what happens in Mission Impossible Fallout? Well, two years after Ethan Hunt had successfully captured Solomon Lane, the remnants of the Syndicate have reformed into another organization called the Apostles, 
under the leadership of a mysterious fundamentalist known only as John Lark. The organization is planning on acquiring three plutonium cores. Ethan and his team are sent to Berlin to intercept them, but the mission fails when Ethan saves Luther and the apostles escape with the plutonium with CIA agent August Walker joining the team. Ethan and his allies must now find the plutonium cores before it's too late. So guys, initial reactions to this one. You might tell already that I quite like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought this was a lot of fun, I have to say. It's 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 yeah. a huge step up in terms of the level of stunts and I suppose the level of <laughs> personal risk for the actors <laughs> involved yeah. as well. Yeah. In terms of story, I think you're right. I think you it is accessible if you haven't necessarily seen some of the previous entries, I think you can just jump in and take it for what it is. Yeah. Uh, okay, you might not necessarily know how everyone fits into this story. Uh, you might not know where uh, the ex-wife, for example, what exactly the history is there, but you don't need a lot of information to work out the relationship that they've had. Like It, it all fits into place. I do think that moment towards the end would be more meaningful if you do have the, the, the previous mm. uh, knowledge that would be gained from the previous films but i think it is accessible for what it is i had a great time watching this honestly it, in some ways i would say it feels a little bit it's not like it feels totally removed because there's a lot of recurring characters and, and stuff here but it feels a million miles away from the first one just in terms of i suppose in terms of the stakes and in terms of the way the film's delivered and i suppose mm -hmm. you would expect this there's been two decades between these two films so yeah. there's bound to be some differences, but I wouldn't necessarily have assumed they were from the same franchise were it not for the title linking them. <laughs> I actually agree with that because it's so far removed from where the TV mm. show started because it used to be like, again, the SNL thing, whereas this one you're firmly following Ethan Hunt and the team he's making, which is just, I don't know, which is totally, like, they have connections, they like each other, you know, it's not like he's a mercenary, he's kind of by himself anymore. He's like properly got a wee group of people he works with so i agree that if like you watch the first one and you watch this one it does seem almost like a different franchise but mm. i didn't struggle to get into it like I, I did worry when you were like oh you're watching the sixth one i was like oh Christ. <laughs> so much has happened in my yeah. <laughs> like, no. uh, but i was pleased to see luther back so i was like that's yeah. all i was so i was like luther's there we're good so directing then, I loved like the halo jump sequence in Paris. Like apparently they did like over a hundred jumps to get that opening <laughs> shot right as the cameraman and then Tom Cruise jumps out of the plane. It's quite remarkable to me, really. <laughs> uh, they use like specifically designed helmets for the film to do the jumps for real at high altitude. So, you know, the camera can actually see Tom Cruise's face uh, so you can see him actually doing it. For a scene that took so much work, though, and time to create, it is over quite quickly. That's my only criticism for that scene, but it's still incredibly impressive. Yeah, I mean, it's cool, but it's like, how much money must that have cost to do? Yeah. Do you know, yeah. it's like, was that really, like, you know, there's some, I'm I'm usually a big advocate of practical effects when you can do it. But there's something to be said for, like, if it takes a hundred times, maybe just yeah. use the computer. <laughs> just use the green screen, man. <laughs> like... You just want the clout of saying you did it? I mean, cool, but like... I was thinking about this, and I, I don't know if this is... I mean, maybe there's no fair fair point to put forward to this fault, but um, Tom Cruise and his stunt work, I think that is largely, especially in like the modern era of his acting career, I think that is one of the draws to him, is what stunts is he going to do himself and how is he going to pull it off? I wonder yeah. if for him like the draw to a lot of these films is the stunt work and less the acting involved in it. Cause I'm struggling to think, and maybe this is really unfair because I'm not that familiar with a lot of his more recent stuff. No, I think, I, I think valid, the yeah. most recent Tom Cruise film where there wasn't an awful lot of stunt work that I maybe saw him in was the remake of war of the worlds. Was that the one he was then like, so that's right. one, 20, yeah. 50, 2004, 2004 maybe so yeah and maybe a bit longer ago yeah. um, i that's i think that's the most recent like non-stunty film i've seen him in and i don't even know if that's fair to say it's non-stunty it's been a while but 
if if what draws him to a lot of these roles is is the stunt action and stuff, he, he's maybe just turning into adrenaline junkie. He's less of an actor and just an adrenaline yeah. junkie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is a total argument. Yeah, yeah, they're just footing the bill for his yeah. skydiving. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's yeah. there's a case to say like now is Tom Cruise like a better stuntman than yeah. he is an actor. I mean, yeah, dude, a hundred percent. I would just, yeah, he yeah. just yeah. is like because he doesn't. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. But see, I do worry about that because I think we're kind of in the era now where we're realizing that stunt work is needlessly dangerous in some cases. Right. And if you have yeah. an actor who's not 100 like I guess he does a lot of training for it, but he's not like had the background of doing the stunt work. You know, he wasn't like a circus performer or whatever, I don't think. But yeah. I always kind of worry because you're seeing so many injuries on sets now. Mm. And then you have him doing it. And that makes people think, oh, well, you know, it can't be that hard if, if he's actually able to do it. And I'm like, I don't. I appreciate these doing it, but I do think there should be, I don't know, like we are in the era now where we're going to consider whether it's worth doing that. Yeah, I mean, there was a report on the uh, Gladiator 2 film where there was a big explosion and people got seriously injured mm -hmm. and they've had to stop. I mean, even I on this film, that, yeah. Tom Cruise broke his ankle. On the building they, jump, yeah. Yeah, and they had to shut down for a few weeks. Yeah. So there is a case for that. Yeah. Even that shooting with rust, you know, stuff oh, like that. It's just safe. Awful. Yeah. Set safety is a big issue right now because people just want yeah. more and more and they're trying to make bigger things. And people want practical effects again. That's it. People do want their practical effects. But it's like, I yes. don't know if I'd have my main star doing all the stuff that he does all the time. I know he wants to do it, but it's mm. not a good precedent to set, really, in my mind. Again, yeah. don't get me wrong. I do appreciate that he's doing it and why he's doing it and he enjoys it. But. The amount of injuries yeah. that are coming out right now because people keep pushing to go to the next level. It's like, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you've heard this interview from Matt Damon about when he was talking to Tom Cruise about the making of Ghost Protocol, the fourth one, mm -hmm. when he's climbing on the outside of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. <laughs> and he told him when they were talking about safety on that and the safety guy told Tom Cruise, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so then he was like, well, I got a different safety guy. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I could do that. So <laughs> he just fired the, the current safety guy and got a different one in. So mad. <laughs> that just that just screams him wanting to do it for his own adrenaline junkiness, as Callum yeah. said. Like, and I'm like, is that really the precedent you want for action films? Because I would rather watch a film where people didn't die, to be quite frank. No. I would rather, <laughs> like, you know, people's lives aren't actually at risk. Like, people can still do stunts mm -hmm. more safely, but, like, do I want to watch Tom Cruise climb a building that badly? Not really, you know? Yeah. I mean, even in that sequence, it's very practical, but, I mean, all the storm stuff, mm -hmm. the lightning, that's all yeah, CG, yeah, yeah. you know, that's all added in mm -hmm. post, so. Wimps. There is, I think you're right. <laughs> Wimps in what? should have jumped into an actual store. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, get, get some electricity yeah, going. Yeah. <laughs> but I think with a lot of the background and effects in that, there could there is an argument, yeah, to say that they could have found a way of maybe doing it digitally if they couldn't achieve it yeah. practically. I mean, they did 100 jumps, so, yeah. you know. Where was was there a line? Yeah, where are you going to stop? To say stop? No, we got to do it a different way. Because every time you do it, you're increasing the risk. It's like, yeah, you know, sure you're gonna get a cool shot, but like, sure, a hundred dives or whatever can go well for the first hundred times. It's just that one, a hundred and one yeah. mm. take where it goes tits up, and suddenly, you know, mm. multiple people are dead. <laughs> You've got no yeah. film anymore. Only needs to go wrong once. Exactly, yeah. and it does so often on sets now because it's just again yeah. just a push for more, and it's like he's gonna have to keep going. I, I, I obviously we've not seen the most recent one, but it's like, God, what? Where can yeah. you go? <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Where can you go? Yeah. Uh, the bike chase in Paris is mm. very impressive to me, just in terms mm. of how fast Tom Cruise is going down these streets with the cars parked or moving, are just so close to him as he whizzes by. Like, and when he's going against like the traffic on the Arc de Triomphe, I'm like, how the mm. hell did they do that? <laughs> <laughs> the choreography on that must have been extensive. You know, the bike chasing the car was pretty impressive too. At times you're like, is Tom Cruise going to run over the camera guys <laughs> in some moments? So I was worried for them. Like the bike going down like the narrow corridor of the pillars at high speed, that was a cool visual as well. So, you know, the, the car chases were really, really impressive, even though that's not necessarily the main focus in the marketing for this type of film. But yeah, but the only thing I would say as well, I don't know if you've seen John Wick 4, Chapter 4, they have an action scene in 
around the Arc de Triomphe, which makes this one look very tame, <laughs> I must say. But it's still very impressive in this one. But also, Keanu Reeves just has so much charisma. Like, you know, it's yeah. unfair. <laughs> like, yeah. Most charismatic man versus Tom Cruise. It's like. That. Hey, I'm James Lovino, and I'm here to tell you about Alternate Sides, a movie podcast with a twist. I've worked in the film business for two decades, but I haven't actually seen that many movies, and this has been driving my frequent collaborator, Saab, a self-confessed film snob, crazy. So every week, while he's stuck in his car trying to avoid getting a parking ticket, thanks to New York City's alternate side parking regulations, we discuss a classic film I've finally just gotten around to seeing, Alternate Sides, a new podcast about movies, parking, and a 25-year friendship, wherever you get your podcasts. (laughs) No contest for Sam. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, favorite shot or scene, guys? What are you going for? Oh well, I, I I wouldn't say this is a this is a a favorite one, but this is just <laughs> this just lets you into my psyche a little bit. So right. <laughs> the way the the way the um the film uh, starts off when you get past the little um uh, dream sequence where the the vows are being warped due to his own mental, I guess, the state. Yeah, you, you get he's he re- he receives a copy of a book with the next mission in it, and in order to hear that mission, he needs to push down and prick his finger on the thing. Now, right. if that were me, uh, I just <laughs> I just wouldn't get to hear the message because I am such a, <laughs> I can't <laughs> I can't deal with needles. Like I had to do uh, one right. of those little um, home finger prick blood test things at home. Like this was this was like about six months ago. I had to do one of those. And I couldn't do it. Like I cannot do it by myself. I need like nurse, <laughs> someone else, <laughs> someone else to do it for me. So I'm not like when I get my secret mission in a book, and they're like, "You just right. need to prick your finger." I'm sorry, but I'm not going to hear. We're feeling no. the world's yeah. going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was notable oh, yeah. for me. But yes, I actually really like in terms of notability. I I do actually like the helicopter chase towards the end. Oh yeah, as well. I think that was beautifully. Choreographed and and played out. It's amazing, yeah. Yeah, I think the the location that it's set in as well. You've got this this huge, vast, mountainous area. I I thought that was stunning. The amount Absolutely. of I can't imagine the amount of time it would have gone into getting every element yeah. of that finished. Yeah, I think he learned to drive a heli or drive a helicopter as well, just for that. Yeah, he did for months, and it's not any normal helicopter. It's like an acrobatic helicopter. It's pretty insane. I think for me, the action scene is just phenomenal to me. Mm. Just for the simple fact that Tom Cruise is flying the helicopter for real just does blow my mind. And (laughs) to successfully do like a diving spiral off a cliff is just crazy that they let him do that. What are you doing? (laughs) Yeah, it's just mad. I mean, helicopters are one of the most difficult aircraft or vehicles to fly period yeah they're super crashable <laughs> yeah, yeah you have to use every limb in your body both arms both legs uh, yeah. to fly these things do you know what i didn't have though a tunnel <laughs> no it didn't. so why bother <laughs> where is your tunnel <laughs> <laughs> yes no tunnel this time <laughs> no but you got a second helicopter yeah. so you know that email uh, worked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's brilliantly captured by Chris McQuarrie's team because I feel like this could easily feel not very intense. And the temptation could be is to go a bit wider with the cameras to like make sure you capture everything properly. But I feel like there's a great mix of cameras mounted inside and outside the cockpit mm. and shots mm-hmm. just capturing the helicopters with pretty long lenses also with the helicopters like crashing into each other near the end and falling and getting stuck etc on the mountain they keep most of the shots like on the inside of the helicopters still to just avoid it being you know too cgi heavy when most of the flying stuff is all real so 
you know, and plus a great death for Henry Cavill too, like hooked to the yeah. face with the weight of a helicopter behind it. That's <laughs> A great death. That was pretty nasty. <laughs> Worst death. Yeah, I kind of love the bit where the helicopter is hanging by the weight of the hook. I did actually shout at my TV. I was like, oh, come on. Like when the helicopter <laughs> is hanging by the helicopter, just by that tiny little bit of crag of rock that was holding it in place. I was like, really? <laughs> I can really? only suspend my disbelief so far. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I am tempted to mention helicopter in a tunnel again. Yes, but, that's uh... true. <laughs> very true but to be fair i think the one thing i will say about the action sequences like that is because they've made him i say made him he has volunteered to learn how to drive that and he's really proud of himself some of the camera work is so focused on making sure the audience knows it's really tom yeah, cruise that it's a that. bit forced it's like okay, <laughs> okay. I, I get it it's him i can see that it's him it's like, i kind of find out a lot of the action sequences in this it's um they were just making okay. sure we knew it was tom cruise so they were like mm. going for his face i'm like we don't need to see his face i believe you See, I don't know. I think for the cost to ensure him to do it, if if he is doing it, you kind of need to get as many shots as possible with him doing it, mm. because only on the basis that it's just not worth the money that it would, like, they kind of have to. I think they're, they're backed into a corner a little bit. Yeah, that furthers my argument. They, they don't need him to do it all the they, time. <laughs> they do need to be boosting his, like, his showreel just with his helicopter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for you, Sam, then, would you have preferred more shots, like, that a lot tighter in on him no i would just rather see more of what's going on rather than making sure that it's him do you know what i mean i would rather right. focus on the action happening and not the action happening but framed to make sure that we see tom cruise's face you know all right okay yeah. <laughs> like it's tom well, cruise yeah. i'm like i know it's tom cruise i've seen it's tom cruise we don't need to see it's tom cruise again because it's a long <laughs> helicopter sequence and they're, they're making yeah. sure we remember it's like he's doing this for reals guys i'm like no, yeah. i know yeah. <laughs> he's getting every penny that they can <laughs> yeah yeah I guess there's no, you don't really need to rely on like geography too much of like where each helicopter is. No. Because it's just mountains, you know, mm. so you're not really trying to focus on specific mountains or whatever. There's only a real one bit where they, where Tom Cruise goes below the clouds. That's the only kind of reference point, really. And then obviously, the, when he goes off the cliff in that crazy spiral, that's about it in terms of geography points. Apparently the bit where he's dangling from the the rope at the bottom of it, like all the cast thought he died because they didn't know what he was really? going to do and something dropped. Yeah, it was on my Instagram wow. reels today because, you know, algorithm knows what I'm talking about today. <laughs> <laughs> They're saying they didn't know what was going to happen. They just saw something black drop from the helicopter. Oh, wow. and like, great, he's dead. Like, that's our job's gone. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> How stressful would it be working on that set with him? Oh, like, God. you wouldn't be enjoying watching no. the stunts. You'd be like, oh, please don't die, please don't die. Directing score, guys, what are you going for? This is on you, Callum. <laughs> mm. <laughs> See, I think I, I think a lot of the stunt work obviously lies into the directing here. So I th I think the directing score has got to be pretty high for this. So are we going are we going eight? Or are we going higher? I think eights. I think eight's perfectly good for this. Because I think as a as a film, this is very this falls much more into like the action heavy category than like the first one would. Mm -hmm. And while I think there is a place for directing well choreographed, well thought out, uh, well acted action scenes, what what this film is lacking for me, I think, is maybe some of the more subtle moments that the first yeah. film kind of had in that way. So I think I would right. put it around about an eight. Like it's not bad at all. Like there's it's not like it's not like anything's been done poorly or, or there's any any missteps or anything like that it's just that i think this is much more of like a of a an action showreel of of like yeah. fun fun yeah. heart in your mouth scenes uh so I, I think an eight is fair well there's no elaborate group heist so zero out of ten <laughs> <laughs> no an eight's um, fine i agree yeah, with an eight, eight. yeah Cool. So I think this is extremely impressive of what they've pulled off here uh, with Tom Cruise and Macquarie's team. Um, so I'm going to go pretty high, guys, like a 9.4 for me. Ooh. A 9.4? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sam is not impressed. Yeah. Not, not a 10, but... <laughs> Yeah, I'm just remember uh, you gave Indiana Jones. I'm like, mm, I don't know, sacrilege. <laughs> <laughs> so screenplay. Then I love how the opening scenes are, are constructed, where you have like uh, Hunt being haunted by the past in this quite vivid dream scene, 
where he gets blasted by a nuclear bomb with his ex-wife. <laughs> then you get like the classic mission message to Ethan, you know, if you choose to accept it. Then the mission in Berlin goes horribly wrong immediately. You know, they lose the plutonium to the apostles and then set them off in Asian countries. So it's uh, frankly a disastrous start for the film. So you're like, this is a massive downer to begin with. <laughs> then the classic like Mission Impossible trick happens from the TV shows, you know, that the nuclear scientist thought he was in hospital, hospital, but it was all a, all a stage and the walls just fall <laughs> away, you know, and they get a, a, a small win by getting the information to find Lark. But it's a small win. You know, the balance mm. of ramping up the stakes to, to having a satisfying opening scene is well done here for me without using your like classic opening action scene. Uh, which happens a lot in the other sequels. So, yeah, I I kind of really admire that. Again, similar to the first one, like they really create some crazy odds for the for the team to overcome, and they're not relying on an action, a massive action scene here either. Well, it's, uh, it's actually ridiculous because like plutonium's like really bad, dude. Like <laughs> it's not a list of agents. You know what I mean? So, see, was the bit when in the hospital. And the news, they have a pretend news anchor saying three yeah. nuclear bombs. The news anchor's so calm. And that threw me <laughs> yeah. off. I'm like, uh, we're all going to die. <laughs> like, why aren't you freaking out? Because I didn't know it was fake. You know, I haven't seen the yeah, film yeah. before. I didn't know the steps before. I was like, why are we so chill about three nukes? Like, we're all dead. Like, we're all going to die imminently. Like, the stakes are, like, ridiculously high. And mm. they have one team. They're trusting Tom Cruise. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, that's the world at stake. That's not yeah. just a list of agents <laughs> being thingy. That is, we're all going to die. Maybe Simon Pegg just missed the rehearsal for that for that trick. I mean, like Tom Tom Cruise and I think Rames are really going for it in this scene because they're obviously you mentioned Callum in Last Crusade. She's these guys are like acting acting at the same time, like mm. they're they're in a role mm. within their character. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, Pegg must have like skipped a few rehearsals. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll um I'll save my thoughts on Simon Pegg for when we are talking about acting because I do have some right. thoughts, but. Okay. but, but <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but. Just but, just but. in terms of the the screenplay bit, I love the speed at which this film gets into things, and I think mm. I, I think to tie into what I was saying before, this film has the luxury of being able to do that because oh, yeah. it's it's, sequel, it's not yeah. yeah it's not trying to establish any characters, it's not trying to introduce us to anyone new. We already know Ethan Hunt at this point, so you're able to just jump into things pretty rapidly. Oh look, here's his mission. Oh look, here he's accepted it. Oh look, it's self-destructed. Off we go. You know, like it's pretty, pretty rapid fire, and then we're we're off to the main sort of, I suppose, introductory establishing point of this particular plot. So it's very, um, very rapid fire with its movements, mm. which I really, really like. I think it's it's a great way to start off. I like that hospital scene or the fake hospital scene yeah. as well. The idea that only an hour has passed. In between them <laughs> capturing this guy <laughs> and them setting up that uh, that stage as well, I think is absolutely great. I, I love mm. that. Um, it's good fun. What I quite admire about this screenplay is that Chris McQuarrie doesn't always write people talking in a room for his exposition scenes. And I quite liked the scene where like the White Widow's brother, Zola, I think his name is, is explaining the heist to extract Lane from Paris. You know, then we see his this slaughter of cops with all the men in masks and Tom Cruise is in a in a mask and he sh- shoots a cop as well. And it's all done with like music with no sound effects at all. And like for me it just reinforces this situation that Ethan Hunt has to potentially kill everyone. He's effectively imagining what he might have to do uh, rather than being told what to do by the widow's brother just in a room. And I like how that scene is just sort of paid off during like the actual heist with his IMF team. They get intercepted by like a female cop and she gets shot by Zola's men. Hunt takes them out pretty quick, but Hunt doesn't just leave her there. He consoles her and apologizes. So I like how the film also creates some doubt about whether Hunt is going to kill any anyone is innocent or you know or not to get the job done so there there is no anti-hero in hunt in all, any of these films really so i kind of like um how that uh scene in particular was constructed 
it's it's funny because it's such a he's so different from the first one. Because you have to keep in mind we've only seen one in one in six now. Mm. Um, I don't think in the first one he would have cared as much about mm. keeping the cops alive. I like how he'd like deliberately went out his way to get everyone out of the back of the truck so that they wouldn't be involved in stuff. So he cares more about you know keeping as many people yeah. safe. I think that's definitely a, a theme that Tom Cruise and Chris McQuarrie are really exploring and kind of starting off exploring in this film and like going into dead reckoning as well like Ethan Hunt wants to save the world but like he's not going to compromise anyone in doing that yeah no collateral damage yeah Yeah. he's very much a character that kind of wants the perfect situation yeah a few of the characters a few of the characters reference that that he is he is the sort of person that would struggle to make a decision between saving one versus saving hundreds Mm. yeah Makes him a bad mercenary, though. Well, I, I was going to say they go <laughs> yeah. on to say like, and you're exactly the sort of per- that they make that makes you exactly the sort of person I want to work with. And I'm sat there like, mm. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, you know, when you're in charge of the, the nukes, not, yeah, not sure about that. But like, I mean, it obviously works out to the degree that it does in the end. That kind of way of dealing with things. But I, I'm not a fan of that kind of black and white. You can save everyone kind of approach because you can't. Like, mm-hmm. here comes Callum to pick a hole in Mission Impossible, but, like, you just can't. <laughs> like, so, no. like, it's... That's what the film is kind of trying to maybe put in doubt a little bit with that kind yeah. of mini speculation dream mm-hmm. sequence, I guess, when he is, when it's just all music, you know, and he kills that cop. Is he going to have to do that in this film to achieve his goal? Um, mm-hmm. So they do play with that a bit, maybe not enough, maybe, later on in the second half of the film. Yeah, but maybe they're kind of just maybe feeding you these themes for the next movie. I don't know, mm-hmm. but um, yeah. yeah. And obviously, this is written by Chris McQuarrie as well, and he does love some twists and turns. And I love the scene in the underground tunnels in London where the changes in who you think is in control changes so many times, and yet it still makes sense. I think, uh, like the IMF team meets Alec Baldwin, the secretary. <laughs> And Hunt explains the planned exchange uh, with Doubling Lane uh, with Benji. Then Alec Baldwin has control by saying the meeting is a trap, like the widow is working for the CIA and reveals they have evidence to suggest Hunt is Lark. Then Hunt sedates Alec Baldwin, so Hunt and his team are back in control. Then it's like revealed that Walker is working with Lane, so you think they have the upper hand now. Then it's revealed that Benji is masked up as Lane. The IMF team are back in control. They call up Angela Bassett to reveal Walker is a bad guy. Uh, Then Angela Bassett is in control by killing the lights and she wants to bring all of them in uh, because she doesn't trust anyone. (laughs) Then Walker says, go. And it's revealed that Walker has his own men, uh, which starts the shootout to gain the upper hand so he can escape. So just an incredible, incredibly complex scene in the writing where mm. at some point, like every party thinks they have the upper hand. It's so good that for me. Yeah. Uh, I were agree. you guys lost in that or was it all very clear the fact that all these changes? I mean, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was lost exactly. I, th- I think a lot of the changes to who's in power at that moment kind of, it flows very well and it kind of makes sense. And I was left thinking, well, how is this going to work out well for anyone at any point? At certain <laughs> yeah. points, I was like, I actually, I, at, at a certain point, once you, once you find out that um, Sloane's involved in it, she's killed the lights. You think like, well, how, how is this going to be resolved for anyone? Like if she's wanting to bring yeah. them all in, you know, how does it like, clearly something's going to happen here, but like, where is this going exactly? And it, it, the pace at which it moves is really rapid which I think works really, really well. I love that, like that whole, mm-hmm. all of that, to be honest. Um, even even up until like the um, Benji being masked up as well, uh, and yeah. that, that reveal as well, all of that's just such good fun. It's good spy stuff, isn't it? That's uh, yeah, exactly like, spy yeah. stuff rather than just pure action. It's exactly what you want. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. I'm, I'm really there for that. Yeah, because you're always expecting like the mask gag to happen in all these films. So I think Macquarie does a great job, especially in Rogue Nation as well. Uh, they really hold that back until a really pivotal moment in that one. Whereas mm. this, it's really well revealed as well. Yeah. The only problem I have with the screenplay is literally how some of the characters are portraying each other. So Luther in particular has this fixation on telling other characters how great Ethan is. And I'm like, we've been with him for <laughs> six, story, you know, six 
films at this point. I don't need he's, he's talking to the plate like Ilsa is our name. Ilsa, he's yeah, like, oh, Ilsa he's only cared about this many people in this life. I'm like, no one speaks like that about their friends in real life. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like he's the best <laughs> wingman ever, but it's so strange. He's like, they're just trying to emphasize how great this guy is and how he's the best ever. And I'm like, okay, yeah. Yeah. like you date him then. <laughs> <laughs> It's not even just about how good he is. It's about how his his job is as well. Yeah. And I'm like, mm. you know, Sam might be in a mood with you right now, but she's edited over 100 episodes of our <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> she she does things with audition that no one else can do. You know, like <laughs> that's exactly it. And doesn't that come across yeah. as so forced and weird? Yeah, it is a bit. We should a... do it more often, mm. though. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah it is it is odd when you think of it like it's funny because now that you've said that totally but like i hadn't i hadn't really thought of it that way like i actually think i i do like his portrayal in this but it, it, the character does seem to have changed somewhat from and i mean i guess it would over six over six films or however many it is yeah a decade and a half yeah. it, it would yeah. change but like he he seems to have changed from you know hired assistant to cheerleader essentially yeah. I, know. <laughs> I think like simon pegg is kind of taken over as the main well he, he's like half and half techie guy and mm. also a bit of help in the field whereas luther is like the backup techie guy now <laughs> yeah a little bit and also maybe they've kind of they've they have, they've attempted to make him like the heart of the team maybe the, the kind of the emotional heart of the team luther i guess for you sam it doesn't come off as well as it could have done <laughs> it just no. comes across as well it's not luther it's the problem is luther referring to ethan like yeah. the heart of the team should not be hype manning the team no. aggressively and the, the moment we're all looking for like these plutonium bombs and like let's <laughs> like, you know ethan only cares about so many people in his life he's had a hard life it's like yeah we get it we're, we're looking for bombs dude like right, <laughs> yeah. right now <laughs> yeah julia's like yeah uh, tell me what to do come on <laughs> let's go on with this yeah, yeah. <laughs> so funny lines the imf is halloween alan a bunch of grown men in rubber masks playing trick-or-treat was a pretty good one hope is not a strategy oh you, oh, my... you must be you <laughs> <laughs> you swain <laughs> yeah that was good was the little car your idea uh from simon Pegg. <laughs> it's definitely not the funniest one i think like the fifth one is probably a little funnier Maybe the fourth one as well, to be honest. Um, certainly tonally, like, there's a more of a slightly darker and serious tone here um, than other ones. But there's still some good, interesting lines. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I do like the one from Simon Pegg, I think, in the London tunnels, where he says, why do I have to be late? And then Luther does this, like, brilliant gesture pointing at him and then pointing at himself, like, I'm black, dude. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that was funny why is he running in circles <laughs> oh yeah i love that actually because he's running in the spiral staircase yeah, yeah. it's funny because when we were talking about scenes i never mentioned that one but see the stuff we doing the parkour things like the bit where he shattered his ankle like almost mm. worth it because that's quite a cool scene just having him run, run across a building mm. yeah. like very pleasing to view yeah <laughs> I can't believe they even that's that's the take they went with as well. Like, <laughs> oh, did they? Yeah, that's the take. He breaks his ankle. Oh, and so he's hobbling off for a reason. Yeah, wow. yeah, because his ankle is broken. <laughs> I know, but I didn't. I thought maybe in the, in the context of the film, he also maybe ow, right. you know. Like, well, yeah. maybe that oh, was yeah. like the only take. Maybe yeah. that was the first one, and they had to move on. You know, so. he's like, I'm not doing that <laughs> again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once is enough. Thank you. God. Yeah. Uh, but I think my favorite line is from Ilsa, where she's at the start of the helicopter chase, where she says, what the hell is he doing? And then Simon Pegg says, I find it best not to look. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Screenplay score then, guys? What are you going for? Mm, what do you think, Sam? You, what, what's your opening gambit? And I'll see if I can... We seem to be fans of the number body eight, don't we? We do. Yeah. It's like we're NPCs. Got four eight so far. <laughs> yeah, we are just eight. Yeah. I, to be honest, I I was thinking like eight. Like I'm our. Well, you, we have decimals. You can use. Decimals. Yeah. <laughs> like I was. To be honest, there was part of me. Like seven seems too low. To be honest, eight probably seems 
fair. Oh, I was going to say, are you? I thought you were going to go for a decimal there. I was like, oh. <laughs> no, I was, I was. No, I think I think fair. I think I think fair. I think eight. I think eight is probably where I would go. Okay. We'll try and not be an NPC for the next bit. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So screenplay for me, I think it's probably not as intricate as the first movie and mm. a lot of the other ones. Yes, it's very action heavy in this one, but I just really like that uh for this film and in a lot of these films they could be accused of just kind of just like forcing these action scenes in there and then they don't seem particularly fluid in terms of what's going on in the story and the screenplay um i think the only one i would say that's maybe the case is the paris um halo jump they don't i don't think they really need to do a halo jump there <laughs> like you just travel to paris and turn up <laughs> you know <laughs> but i think with everything else i think it's pretty with all the other action scenes that it's all pretty fluid in terms of, in relating to the story so mm. i really enjoy that so i think i'm gonna go um with like an eight point eight point four uh, eight point four yeah see i view your scores in the hundreds and i view ours in tens <laughs> It makes yeah. sense. You know what I mean? So you're you're doing eight four out of a hundred, and me and Cal yeah. are doing eight out of ten. It's different scales. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, so acting, then I mm. loved the bathroom <laughs> fight in Paris with Tom Cruise, Liang Yang, the fake, the decoy, John Locke, mm. and Henry Cavill. Mm-hmm. It's very brutal. And for most of it, I can't see where the fakery is. It just looks like they're (laughs) hitting hitting seven blows out of each other. But I love the little bit of acting from Tom Cruise when Yang is knocked out in the cubicle and Tom opens the computer to scan his face and it's broken because Henry Cavill used it to like knock (laughs) knock him out with it. (laughs) And Tom Cruise just does this little like hand gesture without saying anything as if to say, what the hell, man? I love that. And then the mm. arm pumping thing from Henry Cavill is just really funny now. <laughs> Every time I see that. I mean, you're right, though. They do take some hits in this. I was thinking that when yeah. I was watching it. I was like, wow, dude, like, you, you know, one hit to the temple, really, you're you're down, mm. possibly permanently. Yeah. But in this, they're getting smashed in the face of all sorts. I'm like, how are yeah. you bouncing back up? It- like, wow. <laughs> There's there's a bit where um, Tom Cruise is kicked in the stomach and he he looks properly winded like he's actually like <laughs> bent over winded during mm-hmm. it and I'm just like that I I know it's like obviously choreographed and stuff but I could quite easily be like tricked into thinking that was real and that they just went yeah. with it like it just there's just certain certain things that don't tend to happen in action films like in the way that uh, it did here just people not recovering. I mean, people in real life, people wouldn't recover that quickly, but especially by an action film standards, people weren't re- recovering quickly uh, as quick enough as you would normally expect them to. Like mm. you were able to see him in pain for a while yeah. while he tried to like <laughs> regain his breath and stuff. Yeah, it's just, uh, uh, yeah totally. I, I think that seems great. Callum, I'm really curious. I want to hear about Simon Pegg now. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> so... So I have a real problem with Simon Pegg. You're just not a fan in general, then? I don't really like Simon Pegg at all. Uh, okay. I I think some of this is unfair because he has been starring in films since, God, how long? It's since the late 90s, early 2000s he's been. I know Shaun of the Dead was 2004. Space was like late 90s, yeah. Yeah, I really struggle to see him in like quasi serious to serious roles like whenever he's right. playing like i i honestly i can't like he is just he is just sean of the dead and hot fuzz to me yeah right. and run fat boy run as well uh, yeah like yeah. I, I i get i know that some of that is self-inflicted because of the type of stuff that him and his um his uh, counterpart were working on at the time but that's what i associate him with so whenever yeah. i see him in a Mission Impossible or a, a Star Trek, you know, a, a Star Trek or something yeah. like that. I really struggle because it's it's just it feels wrong. It's not his main talent. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like having. Let's go back to Mariah Carey. It's like Mar- having Mariah Carey host a cooking show. You're like, why are you doing that <laughs> when you could be doing a singing show? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Where yeah, because he is a good comedy actor, but it's very mm-hmm. strange having him be in there pretending to be hung. I'm like, mm, I don't know if I'm buying this. You know, I'm trying yeah. not to laugh at you because it's not funny, but like you are the comedy yeah. man. Yeah, I, I I do struggle with him, and I, I get that that's not fair to a point because he, I would say objectively speaking, if I remove me from it for a second, he's not bad. 
It's just that I, no. I struggle to separate him. I think actually, funnily enough, I, I heard someone else saying this about Adam West recently. Like after right. after he started appearing as like the mayor in Family Guy, whenever he was anywhere else, they were just like, this is just a silly man. Like, you know, like you couldn't take him in a serious role after that because he was just like the crazy cookie. I mean, to be fair, it's Adam West, dude. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I know, but like he was um he was he played a serious character in 13 and the this thing i was listening to they were talking about they can't take him seriously because the character right. his whole thing his whole shtick has just kind of butchered that you can't take him in a serious role and i think simon Pegg falls into that same category that adam west would uh for me at okay. least but i mean he is kind of more of the he is su- supposed to be like the comedy relief guy anyway in this film i think yeah but he's not funny enough to be the comedy relief guy you yeah. know what i mean because he's not doing his simon Pegg stuff yeah because yeah. i think also like a tonal thing as well like this is a much more serious tone compared mm-hmm. to the because in like rogue nation there's more physical comedy stuff in like mm-hmm. a car chase in that with, without him even saying anything so th- i mean there's a few moments where i find found it quite funny from him when during the running scene from tom cruise <laughs> and he's like oh right here Mm-hmm. oh or oh, sorry left and then he's yeah. like i'm jumping out a window <laughs> oh yeah oh sorry i had it in 2d yeah, yeah and then luther right. gives him a terrible look of just like what are you doing man that one sequence is great that's a real conflict for me because i love that yeah. sequence and mm-hmm. yeah i kind of feel like if this film doesn't need a character like that like i don't that, that that's where i am toing and froing because that sequence is brilliant but mm-hmm. i don't know that him as a character and i'm i understand as well he's in he's in a few of the mission impossibles this isn't a one-off for him i know he's in a no. few of the previous ones as well but i just don't he's got an uphill an uphill battle for me to be honest someone who doesn't have an uphill battle for me henry cavill what a tash what a yeah. tash that guy has i'm not a, i have to say yeah like i'm a bit like mm, you need to deal with that but like I'm increasingly <laughs> like I'm in, no, but like I'm in, I'm increasingly a stan of Henry Cavill. I mm. think the way that he's dealt with a lot of uh, stuff to do with The Witcher, outside of that, the way he defends mm-hmm. gamers, he's really yeah. into gaming and stuff himself. Warhammer, love him. I love Henry yeah. Cavill. I got a big soft spot for him. Yeah, yeah, I've got a lot of time for him as well. Like I, I think he really, really, he really, really cares about his art which sounds yeah. really film student mm-hmm. to say, but he does. He cares about the projects he's involved in and that they're portrayed in the right way. He cares about the fans as well, who are of the projects. And he cares about yeah. the fans. So like, I'm, I have a lot of time for him and therefore I'm yeah. willing to give him the benefit of the doubt whether or not he deserves it. Maybe. I think he does deserve no, yeah. it in this, though. I think yeah. he is good in this. In interviews as well with this, he was really humble with the fact that this whole experience, he was saying that it's just a massive learning experience of how to do all these kind of elaborate action scenes. Mm. So it, it sounded like he was so appreciative of the fact that he had the opportunity to do this yeah. film. So, And also, I find it hilarious that... <laughs> Uh, he was filming the Justice League film at the same time, and he wasn't allowed <laughs> to shave his mustache. <laughs> so, they had to CGI that, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, the they had to CGI his lip, so that's why sometimes <laughs> it looks really funky <laughs> in yeah. that movie. I mean, he is really good in this. He's yeah. he's he's a real physical presence that the series really hasn't had for Ethan Hunt to face, particularly. So certainly, like tonally that there's another interesting w- uh, way they're approaching the film as well with mm. Cavill's character you know I th- and I think they do a really good job as well in terms of the writing of like really hiding the fact that he is a bad guy in the end I think a lot to do with that is just kind of his attitude as well and the guy's persona in in this film they kind of they get at each other don't they they're, they're quite you know they squabble a little bit on the on the on the airplane when you have those type of relationships in films like this they tend to you know use that as a way to suck the audience in to say yeah this guy is definitely the bad guy but they ter- they don't end up being the bad guy you know they are actually a good person but they don't do that at all you know they double bluff you in in a certain extent mm. so um yeah i really like his performance as well the other note i had it was i love the acting from cruz and michelle monaghan when she turns up 
in Kashmir in the medical camp. Mm. And then before uh, they can really say anything, her husband turns up and Ethan has to think on his feet to explain mm. why he's there and how he knows Julia. Yeah. Uh, Ethan and Julia, you know, used to be married and they, you know, haven't seen each other for like three movies. So, <laughs> <laughs> A funny period of time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they have to hold in their emotions, you know, to mm. not spook her husband, you know, Julia. Julia knows there's like a crit- critical situation pretty early on in the conversation. So I love how balanced and restrained they look in handling their emotions there. I thought yeah. it was quite a, a very different, um, unexpected scene there in terms of performances. It was suitably awkward as well. Like it was <laughs> yeah. just, it was, uh, quite hard to watch especially with how oblivious the husband was oh it's great you two should yeah catch up you should yeah <laughs> oh, it's, a, it's yeah. a shame you're here with all the work being done but you two should catch up this will be great yeah it's like, oh god he's like no like even at the end when they're in the hospital at the end you know that we still yeah. awkward in the room yeah <laughs> yeah that doesn't go away yeah no I, I thought they were great i i like um angela bassett as sloan as well feisty uh, rebecca ferguson as well i thought was good and obviously, like Ving Rhames again as well. For, for all we were saying about his character being a hype man, essentially a hype man, a hype man. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> it sounded bad. A hype man. <laughs> I thought he was good as well. I, I generally, I, I think the the cast broadly in this is is pretty pretty good, honestly. It's good, but it's so different to how the first one was delivered. You know what I That's mean? It's it. like film yeah. changed so much. It's like a different. There's a charm to the '90s one, right? And yeah. this one's like objectively better. But I can't really mm. put a I can't really say how, but it's just the way they deliver the lines is so different. Like I, I, yeah. I can't even describe it. I, I don't know how to describe it. I think that's just how <laughs> films are nowadays. So like, yeah. you can't bring back the eighties, no matter how much I want to. When it comes to cinema, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you count like the the Tom all the Tom Cruise insane stunt work as acting, or is that that does that not count? <laughs> I think you'd have to because that is the the bulk of the film is the action, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like we're, we're evaluating ten minutes if we don't go by the action. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. No, I I think you probably do have to. Um, because I mean, I mean, stunt work is acting. It's just a different type of acting. Obviously, it just it just involves a lot more planning and a lot more uh, danger. <laughs> yeah, like even so, stunt actors, I would say they're actors. I wouldn't say they're yeah. just stunt men. I'd say they're they're actors because they're acting that they've been smacked in the face or they're acting like they've been pushed down some stairs. That's hard to do. Yeah, yeah. convincingly especially yeah, yeah convincingly without killing yourself hard to do mm, so yeah. i would give them yeah the credit one, they deserve yeah 100 percent. i would say though like with tom cruise is i think for sure he's more of a stuntman than an actor in mm. this film mm-hmm. <laughs> but i find it funny there's some just random dialogue that he does in the helicopter and i just feel like that's not necessarily in the script that's just nerves <laughs> That's just coming out. It's like airspeed, mm. altitude. I'm like, uh, what's he saying? What's he doing that for? <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so I just feel like that's nervous energy, maybe. <laughs> Could be. You know, going going back to what Cal said. You remember you said you can't remember seeing him something that wasn't actiony. Me, yeah, yeah. The last thing I saw him in was Rock of Ages, and it suddenly popped into my head. Did you ever see right. Rock of Ages? I don't think no. I've seen that. He like sings into someone's pants at one point, and I'm like, this really? stu- <laughs> "You're so lucky that we didn't do Tom Cruise films because that's what you would have been packed with." <laughs> oh. uh, favorite performance, guys? Who are you going with? Probably for me, probably Hen- Henry Cavill. For me, okay. <sighs> I don't know about you, Sam. Have you got who else? I'm, I was going to say Henry Cavill, but I sound like I'm copying now. I almost said Simon <laughs> Pegg just to mess with you, but I'm not. <gasps> <laughs> Henry Cavill for sure, like a hundo mm. p, <clears throat> hundo p. Henry Cavill because he's just he's great. He's a great villain, yeah. pretend villain. You know what I mean? He yeah. did a really good job. Yeah, I think you know the performances in this are are really good across the board. Mm. I, th- I think maybe the performances are a little bit more memorable in the first movie. You know, mm. the, ki- the the actor Henry Zerny is just great as the villain. Uh, Sean Harris as Solomon Lane is kind of really great and creepy as well. I'm tempted to go with him, but I think I'm probably going to be boring again and go with Tom Cruise because just the (laughs) amount of insane stunts he's done in this film, like just the helicopter scene again, is just mad to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. It's not a bad choice at all. 
I mean, we were doing something wrong by not picking him, honestly, because it's like how we said last time, like Harrison fair, Ford and Indiana Jones. Yeah, we've not got that same like connection to the series. Yeah, you guys are picking the backing dancers, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, we are. We're picking the backing dancers. Uh, so score, guys, for acting. What are you going for? We're probably going to say it like an like I don't know. We can't say eight. <laughs> are we going for seven or nine, Callum? <laughs> yeah. See, I'm stuck because I think what you said before was correct in that there is something here or there's a charm from the performances in the first one that's missing here. Yeah, so we're saying seven, aren't we? Potentially, yeah. But like go seven said does, eight for that one. I think we may have to go seven because I, f- I feel like seven does it down a little bit. Like for the most part, I think it's... All right, I can justify this. <laughs> I, think, I think most of the cast are probably around about a nine. And then mm-hmm. Simon Pegg for me is a two, so we'll go, <laughs> so we'll go seven. Right now. Seven. <laughs> we'll go seven. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna stay in the eights for this one. I think, yeah, as I said, like all the performances for me are all pretty good mm. across the mm-hmm. board. There's certainly more subtle acting going on here, um, but in the first one, it's just more interesting acting. If you know what I mean, you know. Mm where they are kind of relying a lot more on the the characters in the first one. But I mean, again, the stun works insane. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I will probably go like an 8.2 for me. Right. Let's add up the scores then for mission impossible fallout. Let's see some random numbers, Callum. Yeah. <laughs> 56, 50, 12, 24. 11. <laughs> Mission Impossible Fallout literally just scrapes it with 49 points exactly, whereas the first Mission Impossible had 48.9. So. Oh. oh my god, I'm, maybe if we ever come on again, we might even yeah. win. We might win one time. Yeah. Wow. We're inviting back after fudging a score so bad. <laughs> literally wins by one decimal point. Um, wow. <laughs> Wow, that's quite remarkable scoring. So next episode, as Oppenheimer is out on the big screens, we'll be talking Christopher Nolan films. No surprises there. And we'll have guests for that one again, hopefully, from Movies to Watch podcast. Guys, Sam and Callum, you have been amazing as always thank you very much for saving the day for this particular episode (laughs) thanks for putting up with us and completing (laughs) mission impossible (laughs) um so i mean i'm interested are are you guys tempted now to watch all the other films or yeah they're on sky movies for free so me as well (laughs) (laughs) yeah i i definitely will i think work my way Mm -hmm. through them because they're very um they're good what we've seen so far it's been they've been very fun watches I have mm-hmm. to say. And it's always nice when you go to watch something with kind of low expectations and are won over so easily as well. <laughs> <All right. laughs> like it's nice it's nice when you're actually like genuinely surprised and like have a lot of fun with these sorts of things. So yeah, no, definitely I'm I'm definitely wanting to, to go and see some yeah. more. Yeah. Agreed. Cool. Yeah, I guess quick ranking for me, I would probably go mm. six as number one, Fallout number one, Rogue Nation number five as number two, third one. Or maybe Mission Impossible 3, uh, and then the fourth one as number five, mainly because Ving Rames isn't in it until like right at the end. I'm just like, how is this a Mission Impossible film if Ving Rames isn't in it? That's not, that's not cool. And also, Brad Bird is the director on that one, and he basically treats Tom Cruise like a cartoon character. I mean, like, there's several occasions where he should be dead, <laughs> he should not be surviving this. So, yeah, that would be my fifth one. And then the last one is Mission Impossible 2 because they just change him into a ninja in that <laughs> one. Um, is that general? Is that like a general, like critical and fan base consensus that the second one's pretty bad? Is that a general? Yeah, I think it's not bad. It's just a bit strange because it's that one's directed by John Woo and, you know, a lot of doves in that, of course. And it's just mm. a lot of like crazy kind of action hong kong moves in there <laughs> yeah I was which like say, you never really see again yeah so I'm, i mostly know john woo for um redcliffe which is very 
yeah, martial artsy, and yeah, mm. like, like it's like, almost seems like a strange choice for a Mission Impossible film. But... Yeah, and there's a weird like love story in there as well. The story's a bit basic, so yeah, it's definitely the worst one, I would say. Guys, uh, this is your opportunity again to tell us about your podcast, and where can we find you? She's Sam, I'm Callum, and One of Us is Bored. You can find us on Instagram at One of Us is Bored. Our podcast is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, Amazon Music, all the usual streaming places. And you can also find us on YouTube. Uh, We do themed months where we will have a selection of films based around a theme. And we have a lot of fun talking about them. And hopefully, if um, you've enjoyed listening to this, you'll be inspired to go and check out some of our stuff. So thanks for having us again. (laughs) Maybe not based on this. (laughs) Maybe not based (laughs) on this. (laughs) Don't like Mission Impossible. Uh, (laughs) They do now, though. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, Guys, it's it's time to say goodbye. Goodbye, Sam and Callum. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. (laughs) Nailed it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's goodbye from me. I am going to figure out what crazy stunt Tom Cruise is going to try to attempt next and hopefully he doesn't die (laughs) from it. (laughs) Bye bye. That's it for part two. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Check out part one if you haven't done so already. But don't stop there. Get involved and tell us what your favourite films are relating to the episodes. Send us a DM or comment on Instagram and TikTok at Film vs. Film Podcast for Twitter at FVF underscore podcast. If you do, we'll give you a shout out on the next episode. If you're feeling really generous, you can buy us a one-off coffee at our Buy Me A Coffee account. Remember, please leave us a five-star review and subscribe. Pod signing off.